This is the day. This is the day. to Tim number 289. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king.
right, so we can, we can look at this song, and the thing about it is this. You can sing that and cry all day long. You know why you can do that? Because if you're not right with the Lord, there ain't one thing to be excited about. Because guess what? When you die, you're dead. That's it. You've got no hope for anything else. You see, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we can stand up here and sing this all day long. But you can't do this. You can't say praise the Lord because when that time comes, we ain't talk. Listen, soon and very soon, that's what everybody's going to be crying about. That's what the Bible says. Man, they'll be asking for the mountains to fall on top of them when he comes back. Oh, but for the redeemed. Listen, for the redeemed. This song means so much more. It means this. We don't have to worry about crying. We don't have to worry about the pain. We don't have to worry about the death. All we've got to worry about is just being around Jesus and praising him all day long. That's what it's about. Hey, sing the whole thing again. We're going to sing the whole thing again. Man, this is good. the Lord he is faithful to us and man soon and very soon you ain't gonna worry about this old world pretty soon when he comes back man we don't have to worry about everything else that's going on we'll be so excited to see the one who died for us the one who made us clean the one who kept us pure by his blood man what a great day that's going to be you see down here this is just the pep rally Right? Did y'all realize that? Some of y'all ain't very peppy. <laughs> We've got to do something about that, man. we got the one that is victorious, and he is with us. And he has conquered death, hell, and the graves. Man, it is good. And
you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Amen. Amen. Man, uh, I, I don't know about anybody else, but man, Sunday school was good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Come next time, right? Come next time, man. I didn't get too many amens out of that, man. But Sunday school was good. It was excellent. Lord's faithful. Mark chapter 2 is where I will be at this morning. Mark chapter 2. And after you have found it, if you would... Stand out of reverence of God's word, Mark chapter 2. All right. Have you got it on? I think we've got it on the screens back there. You got it anywhere? I believe it's up there. Mark chapter 2, and we'll be starting in verse 1. And the Bible says this, And when he, speaking of Jesus, returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. Verse 3, And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. Verse 4 says this, And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you. For your spirit already dwelling in our midst. And so Lord what I ask is would you continue to move in a mighty way? Would you continue to draw us close to you? Would you continue Lord Jesus to speak to us as we are here today? I pray dear Heavenly Father Lord would you help me? Lord remove me out of this and Lord Jesus may you only be heard and seen. We trust you today. We give you all the praise the glory, the honor, and the worship. It all belongs to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and we all say together, Amen. Amen. You may be seated, seated. Many people for a long time have feared to pray the prayer, Lord, whatever it takes. They are afraid because God might actually answer the prayer that they prayed. And if he answers the prayer, what goes through many people's minds is that he may make them do hard things. He may make them go to hard places. He might even make them suffer. He may even take people away and take the things away that they love the most. God may even make them miserable, is what goes through a lot of people's minds. Sometimes praying, Lord, whatever it takes, feels very dangerous. But can I tell you something this morning that I want you to realize? Is that it is not dangerous to pray this way. It's actually dangerous not to pray this way. But just as much as I believe that we must pray in this manner for ourselves, for our families, and for our friends, I believe that we must act on the prayer that we pray of Lord whatever it takes in that same way. There must be an action that goes to it. There are a lot of times that people pray and they never do anything. There are a lot of times that people pray and the Lord opens a door and they still don't move. A lot of times people pray and they may have said, Lord, whatever it takes. And the Lord says, okay, here it is. And they sit on it. But today, we're going to read a passage of scripture that many of you all have heard before. And just last week, as I preached on a man named Lazarus that was dead, he was more than dead, four days Past dead. 
And today we're going to find a man that was not dead, but perhaps because of the situation that he was in, his condition, may have at one time in the aspect of himself already wished that he was. Maybe this morning some of you all are in that place. In verse 1 we see here, the Bible says, And when he returned to Capernaum. If you go back just a little bit, you will see where Jesus had went into the wilderness by the Spirit taking him. He was tempted for 40 days, 40 nights by Satan. And he would come back out and he would be in Capernaum in Galilee and he would go around and he was preaching and healing the sick. But in the aspect of it, there was a time when he said, you know what? I can't go back there right now. I need to move into the other places, the other towns surrounding this area. And Jesus would go out and he would begin to preach. He would begin to do the miracles even in the surrounding countries that were there. And in right now, he begins to get back to this place. I love the aspect of the last part of this verse. The last part of this verse is good. The last part of this verse is, man, awesome, I think, in the King James Version, right? So in the King James Version, it really tells us this. And Jesus was in the house. Oh, did y'all realize that? Some of y'all are like, is that supposed to be exciting? Well, I don't know. Some of you all need to go back home, go to bed, wake back up, and come back to church. Is what needs to happen, right? Oh, my goodness. It says Jesus was in the house. I, I don't know about you, but I'll just go ahead and tell you, he's here this morning. So in all reality, the aspect of it is this. You can say, well, I just don't feel it. No, that's only because you choose not to, because he's here. You see, there's not an aspect of where we meet together that God doesn't do something. He does something. It's just a matter of if you choose to allow him to or not. Always a choice when you come to the house of the Lord. Whether God moves in your life. Uh, more than likely, the place that he returned and the home that he was at was Peter's. If you go back just a little bit further in Scripture, uh, it will tell us that Jesus had went to Peter's house because his mother-in-law was sick. And he healed her in that aspect. So more than likely, he went back to Peter's house. And he was there with them. And people began to hear about that. And so in verse 2, it says, And many were gathered together. They had come from all over the place to see and to hear what Jesus was doing. The Bible says that so many people were there. It says so that there was no more room. Going back and thinking about it, and if you were to do the history, the houses back then were not very large. So it's not like it would have took a lot of people to fill up that place. Uh, but I want you to know that when Jesus came on the scene... People began to move in so tight that it was just almost barely you couldn't move. They would get into the place to where, man, it would be crammed together. And so the Bible tells us there was no more room. The house not being very big, but they began to even in the outside of it. So here's this aspect of this small house. People cram into it. Jesus is up front, as always, wherever he was at, and he would begin to preach to the people. He would begin to talk about them, about the Word. Back then, I guess... In the reality of where they were at, they didn't have the 80% rule. Anybody know what the 80% rule is when it comes to church? They say this. You go through ministry and you go through training and what they will tell you this. When you get to 80% maximum in church seating, people quit coming. Anybody ever heard that? Okay, well look it up. It is statistic that they have. 80%. So when you reach an 80% capacity of whatever the church can hold, people won't come back if they have come and there's over 80% of the people. And so what begins to happen is this. They begin to say that, you know, people just don't like to have to be cramped together and sit real close to each other when they come to church. They like to be able to have, and if you were to look right now, really throughout the whole church, you know what there is? A good spacing. Right? So what if I were to say, let's stop, and the ones that are able to, I want you to just come over, and we're all going to sit just in this section. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, I don't think so. <laughs> you know why? Because you got that 80% all over you. You're like, whoa! 
Can't handle that. But truly, I believe that that is probably the most ridiculous statistic that I have ever heard in my life because I haven't seen it applied to any other thing in society. So you take a sporting event. I have never seen a sporting event to where they said this. Once it reaches 80% capacity, people will just walk away because they won't come. You know what I see a lot of times when I look at sporting events? I see people crammed into a place, whether it holds 10,000 or 150,000, they cram in so close together that they're literally sitting in each other's lap. Oh, come on. But in the church, we're like, well, I just did just not enough room on my pew. <laughs> and I see these people sitting, and then I see these people sitting, you okay? Good. So I see people sitting, and they're literally like this. I mean, they're just... <laughs> Woo! And you can't even cheer because I've got you held down. Woo! Right? Y'all think I'm crazy? Anybody even see any part of the Super Bowl after church last, night, uh, last Sunday night? Right? Did you realize, man, they were crazy? And you couldn't find an empty spot in that place. I guarantee you, more than likely, it was over capacity with the people that were there. And did you realize that that doesn't apply to restaurants? You ever been in a restaurant and you walk in and there's 75 people waiting in the waiting area. And the re- you look inside the restaurant and it's just like they're everywhere. And when they come to you and they say, I've got a table for you. Would you like to come and sit? And this is what happens. You have a table. And literally, the table that you sit at is right in between the other people's table. And really, they're eating off your plate. You're so close to each other. (laughs) Right? And yet, in the church, they tried to tell us that once a church reaches 80% capacity, people just don't feel comfortable getting close to each other. Now, that's not the reason. People don't feel comfortable when the Holy Spirit begins to convict. And what they say is this. They use an excuse of saying 80% capacity. I just can't come back because there's just not enough room. I'll tell you this. We'll make room. Right? But we have people that are so scared to sit beside somebody because they're scared to death. Ralph's going to bite them. Right? You're mean. I know. I've heard it. Right? No, I'm just joking. So, but the aspect of it is this. When Jesus comes on the scene, it don't matter. Because people will pack in like sardines when the truth is being proclaimed. Here we find it. With Jesus, man, they moved in in such a way that, man, they couldn't get anything. But the last part of that verse, man, it's good too. Because you know what the Bible says Jesus was doing? He wasn't singing kumbaya. Come on. He didn't get them together and pat them on the back. No, the Bible says, and Jesus preached the word to them. You see, it does no good for you to come to church this morning and me to stand up and get the Reader's Digest and begin to read out of the Reader's Digest to you because that's not going to help you a bit. It does no good for me not to have prepared for what I believe God is wanting to speak to you. And so I just kind of take it easy all week and then kind of come in and say, well, I just don't know. I guess I'll just flip open the Bible and whatever it lands on, that's what I'm going to do. No. It's an aspect of preparing because God's word, it has to go forth. Jesus began to preach to them. You see, there were no miracles yet. We didn't read of them. It wasn't that all of a sudden Jesus began to heal people and the crowd came. No, the crowd came and Jesus didn't say, oh, you're here, let me heal you. No, he said, you're here, let me preach. Let me get the word out to you. For Jesus, that was enough is to preach. And Because see, the whole aspect is this. Who better than to preach the word than the word? Oh, come on. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? And so all of a sudden we see this. Jesus preached because, man, He is the Word. So I don't believe there's ever been a preacher like Jesus. He knew it all because He's the one that informed them of it. In verse 3, in verse 3, there are some things 
that we don't know about this man. The Bible tells us that he was just a paralytic. He was just carried by these four men. But you see, we don't know how long he had been this way. We don't know how long he had been in this state. In other parts of Scripture, the Scripture will reveal to us and let us know that sometimes they have been born that way. Other times, it was 30 years. Other times, it would put other things into it. And that's how long they were there. You see, another part of this Scripture, this aspect, it doesn't tell us how far the men traveled. They could have traveled from next door, or they could have traveled from the other town. And so here we find four men that had carried, right now, a paralytic on a bed, each at each corner, bringing him in, no, not realizing to us how far they had actually went. Above and beyond, maybe, the call of duty, some would say. Four men willing to do it. The last verse begins to tell us just a little bit more. You see, I'm not going to preach a long time this morning. But verse 4 begins to tell us just a little bit more. Verse 4 says this. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd. Oh man. How sad it would be. How sad it would be. If this morning we were so full to capacity here. And in the fellowship hall. And in every Sunday school room. All the way out the door. That the cars couldn't even get in the parking lot and they were lined up down the street all the way back to the road. How sad that would be. Why? Because there are some people that couldn't hear the word. That were trying to get here to hear it. You see, in all reality, can I tell you something? There are some days here at the church that we have commodities. Anybody know that? Okay. Guess what? If you come on those days, guess what you'll find? Oh, come on. Some of y'all are getting quiet because we just don't like to talk about that. They're backed all the way up to McDonald's. Whether it's 20 below zero or 175 outside, backed all the way up. Yet when we open up the doors and say, man, we're going to offer the free gospel of Jesus Christ, they snooze away because it doesn't really entice them that much. Oh, my, how priorities have changed so much. With us as people. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd. Now, do you want to know why they couldn't get near him? Well, Pastor Dwayne, the Bible tells us. Because <laughs> of the crowd. Uh, yeah, you could say because of the crowd. But can I tell you another aspect of the crowd? Oh, come on. Y'all are going to like this. Another aspect of the crowd that I didn't read to you that's actually found in Scripture you see, if you were to go on down just a little bit more, in verse 6, the Bible gives us the answer of why they could not get close to the Lord. Verse 6 says this, Now some of the scribes were sitting there. Guess who had the front row seat? Oh, come on! All of a sudden, we look around and some Pharisees are in the house. Now, back then, not every Pharisee was a scribe. Not every scribe was a Pharisee. But they did do those together and they hung around in that sect. And so, all of a sudden, we see, hey, the Pharisees are in the house. And guess where they went? All the way to the front. Insomuch that the Bible says that the people that needed to get to Jesus the most weren't able to because the ones that thought they were holier than thou would not let them in. Oh, man, that's a tough one to swallow, right? Because we come to church and we say this, well, I know that he's going to preach a good message, but it's not for me. Or there in the middle of my message, somebody will say, man, I wish such and such were here. Do we ever stop to think that maybe God's word is for us? And if we would focus on ourselves and God's word, that he could deal with us and then we'd be able to deal with people accordingly, right? As the scripture would go on to tell us, hey, get the log out of your own eye before you try to get the speck out of your brother's eye. Now listen, some people say, no, you just can't judge. And that's the very key point to judge. Well, you better read the rest of that scripture. Because what it says is this, make sure you get the log out so that you can go back and help get the speck out of your brother's eye. Oh, come on. How'd you know your brother had a speck in his eye? Oh, you're a judger. Every one of y'all are going to die and go to hell, right? 
Oh, I know. Some of you are like, well, we'll talk about this later. Well, go ahead. I've got the scripture right there to back it up. Anyway, we see in the aspect of it, man, they are there. They, they have come right up front, and they're not about to move. They weren't there because they could not wait to hear such an amazing message by the word, preaching the word. They were there because they wanted to say, we don't like you. They wanted to be there so they could heckle Jesus. They wanted to be there so they could get upset with everything that he was going to say. Sometimes I'm afraid we are more worried about the Pharisees showing up than we are about Jesus showing up. We say, man, I hope such and such comes to church. Well, can I ask you this? In your mind, the people that you are saying, man, I hope such and such comes. When's the last time you saw them at the altar? Oh, I know. Well, guess what? If you're holier than thou, you need to repent right now. When's the last time you saw them crying and saying, Jesus, touch my family? When's the last time that you heard them crying out on behalf of the church to do a work like never before? You see, so many times we're more worried about those type of people than we are Jesus Christ, the Messiah of the world, showing up on the scene to help people that really want something in their lives. Tough, isn't it? Oh, they were there. They couldn't get close to Jesus. And the problem with the ones that were sitting up front is they weren't about to move to help out the paralytic whatsoever. The Bible says, and they were sitting there. When's the last time in our church? Come on, let's sit at home. When's the last time in our church we saw someone come in that we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt they needed something to happen in their lives? And yet, we never moved a muscle. When's the last time somebody came into the church that was dirty and stinky and filthy with no money whatsoever and you ran up to somebody else in the church and said, that is the person we need in the church. I was talking to them this morning in Sunday school class. I wonder how many times we would go up to those people and say, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, man, and we pat them and it's like, it's like pig pen, right? It's coming to the church. But I wonder how many times we get excited about that. Or when do we get excited when we say, I bet that person's got money. We need to get them in here because we got a lot of... No. We need to focus spiritually. Focus spiritually. Focus spiritually. Focus because when you lose focus spiritually, your church is dead. It's dead. It's dead. And I don't care if you've got 27 multimillionaires in the church. The church is dead without the spiritual aspect of it and seeing the need for people to be able to get to Jesus. You see, we have enough Pharisees that are sitting here that are not willing to move an inch because all of a sudden they're saying, bless me if you can, preach something that's really good, tell me what you want to do, and they miss the whole aspect of Jesus moving through our service. Good preaching, Holy Spirit. Come on. Some of y'all gotten real quiet now. Well, you're just meddling. Oh, we'll talk about it after service too. Verse 4. We're still here. It says this. Though they couldn't get near him because of the crowd, it didn't deter them any. Listen to me. It didn't stop them. They didn't go back and say, well, we traveled all this far. They didn't look back at their friend and say, well, I'm sorry, we brought you this far. We just can't do it. I just don't know what else to do. We can't get you any closer. So we'll just take you on back home. No, the Bible says this, they removed the roof above him. So let's just say in all reality, right? So let's take an average size man with an average size mat. And let's say that they got up on that roof, and you know what they did? Let's just say on average, they put in a three-by-six-foot hole in someone's roof that wasn't even theirs. Well, I can't believe that somebody walked into our church and tried to take the roof off of this building so that somebody could get to Jesus because we like our building too much. Don't you dare take that thing off of there. 
We like the way it looks. Did you know that this thing can come out? You don't know. Such and such donated that. Well, bless their heart. Sometimes we're more worried about how the church looks than we are about how the people in the church look. And I'm not talking about the clothes they wear. I'm talking about the spiritual state they're in. And all we're worried about, does the piano sound good? Does the organ look good? Is all the dust off of it? Is all that? Hey, you do a great job, but my aspect is this. Who cares? If all this burns and it's gone to the ground, did you realize there's still a spiritual aspect that needs to be done? But too many times we get into this place and we begin to say, you know what? We've got our golden calf stuck up here and we're scared to death to move the pulpit. We're scared to death to say anything about anything else because such and such put that there. And my great, 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 grandmother did that. Well, praise the Lord. She's not here. She'll never know if I moved it. Right? They removed the roof above him. The craziest people in the whole world. That just because they couldn't get to Jesus, they said, well, we'll make sure that we find a way. They were so concerned about the friend that they said, there ain't nothing going to deter us. I don't care how large the crowd is. I don't care how small the house is. I don't care how tall it may be. We're going to get you up there, and we're going to find a way to get you to the place you need to be. You see, the whole aspect of this, listen to me, the whole aspect is probably Peter didn't even know who they were. The Bible doesn't tell us their names. Usually, if somebody knows their names, they put them in there. But all this tells us is that he's a paralytic and he had four friends. So someone that didn't even know the people that owned the house cut a hole in this roof. Well, we'll sue them. The insurance company will pay it all. We'll get that going. What are you going to do if somebody walks in here that's not a member of the church? What are you going to do if somebody walks in here that's the first time ever? What are you going to do when those people step inside our doors? Are we going to say, don't you dare mess it up? What are you going to do when the children get off the church van and they walk in and they put a big line down your wall? <gasps> Don't think it hadn't happened. Don't think it probably won't happen again. But I'll tell you this, if it happens and I hear it, it'll be the last time it does happen from that person. Because I'll take every wall in this place scuffed up if it means that they find out about Jesus Christ. I'm not worried about how pretty the church is. I'm worried about how good we look from a spiritual aspect of Jesus Christ working in our lives. The Bible goes on to say this. They let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. You see, they just didn't open the roof. Listen, they didn't open the roof and say, hey, Jesus, we got a boy up here. Come on up. And they could have, but that's not what the Bible said they did. They didn't open the roof and tell their friend, now listen close, paralytic. Jesus is preaching the word, and we've got you as close as what we can get you, and what we want you to do, just lay there on that bed and listen. That's not what they did. They opened the roof and they let their friend down, and guess where they let him down at? Oh, come on. You're the front row. I'm not calling you a Pharisee. You're the front row. Jesus is up here and he is preaching. Preaching the word. The word, preaching the word. And all of a sudden, a light shines down that's not his light. <laughs> and Jesus looks up and a three by six foot hole has been made in Peter's house. And Jesus looked around and said, okay, dismissed. Oh, wait, no. In all reality, maybe Jesus was sort of like, maybe I need to be and other preachers need to be, is that unless a grenade goes off, you keep preaching, right? So all of a sudden, the hose cut in the roof, Jesus is preaching, Pharisee's sitting on the front wanting to get it, and his friend said, you know what, it ain't good enough for us just to get as close as we can. What we're going to do, we're going to let you down in front of the ones that think they got it all figured out. Because we want Jesus to do something in your life. And so as Jesus was preaching, all of a sudden, a man is lowered. Listen to me. 
lowered down in front of Jesus so that now there is a paralytic between Jesus and the first row. I wonder if that paralytic just looked at Jesus. He was just there because, see, here's the aspect of it. (laughs) There wasn't a lot he could do. His friend said, let's go. We're taking you. We know a man that can touch you. We know a man that can do it. You see, the, the aspect of it is this. The ones that were sitting in the front row didn't want Jesus to really do anything in their lives. They didn't want their sins to be forgiven. They didn't want healing to come to them. And so what just happened is this. All of a sudden, some people got excited, and they said, We know Jesus is here, the Word that is preaching the Word. We've seen Him do all kinds of things. But we believe that He can do more than ever before. And so they make their way, carrying Him no matter how far it was, making sure they could get there. And they got to the aspect of where the roof was the thing that was going to hinder them. And they said, No, 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 hold up. Hold up. We can do this. Let's cut the hole. Let's cut the hole. Let's make the way. You remember last week what I preached on? Last week what I preached on was this. Somebody had been praying for the stone to be rolled away. You remember that? Oh, come on. You know what I believe? I've been praying for you this morning, last night. I've been praying that, guess what? Somebody would cut the hole out of the roof. Oh, we need some things to be opened up here. We need some things to be opened up here. We need some people to be saying, I want to make sure I've done everything that I can to get people to Jesus. My question to you this morning is this. Have you been praying, Lord, whatever it takes? Lord, whatever it takes? Lord, whatever it takes? But my question to you is this. Some of you are saying, well, I've invited people. They just won't come. Did you put action to it? Did you go knock on their door? Did you tell them, I'll take you? Oh, come on. It's so much to say, oh, I prayed for people to come, but put action to what you're actually saying. Lord, whatever it takes. And that even means if it's me that needs to go and get them and pick them up. If it's me that needs to do something to be able to get them to Jesus. Lord, whatever It takes. That's what I'm willing to do. You see, this morning the roof has been opened and Jesus is here. And as David comes to the piano, I wonder, as we begin to think about this whole aspect of it, when's the last time that you brought someone? You say brought them to church? No, I'm saying brought them to Jesus. When's the last time it burdened you so bad that you couldn't sleep at night? When's the last time that you cried out for God and said, Lord, you do whatever it takes in their life? When's the last time that you stopped and you said, you know what? It's about time that I put feet to my prayers and we begin to help people like none other. When's the last time they walked through the door and you walked up and you said, man, I'm so glad you're here. God's going to do some great things today. He wants to move in your life. You see, this morning, if you're here, as the roof has been opened, maybe some people have brought you. Maybe you're paralyzed. Maybe you've been dead. Maybe you wish that you were dead. Maybe in the whole aspect of it, you're looking around and you're thinking, man, what else can I do? Well, right now, someone else has done it for you. And Jesus is here. But can I tell you, don't you dare let the crowd deter you. Don't you dare let them keep you away because right now the opportunity's here. And someone has went out of their way to make sure you're able to find him. You see, don't let the ones who say they don't need help keep you from receiving the help. Because he wants to do it this morning. Would you stand today?